uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining in person. And for those of you joining online, thank you as well. Notes, interesting. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, okay. uh, okay. um, so is, is anyone here not in, in the room, not from the LSE? Uh, it was an open invite, so I don't know if any of you have any guests today, but if so, welcome to the LSE. For those joining online, thank you for joining us to this hybrid event. Um, we're really fortunate to have uh, Professor Gavin Yami. Is that the right way to pronounce it? There's Yami, there's Yami, there's Yummy. <laughs> I did have a cousin, Basil Yami, who was a professor here years ago. He died when he was 102. There you go. He wrote the first ever textbook, apparently, on the economics of low and middle income countries. There you go. P.T. So, Bauer and Yami B. Check it out. Okay. So it's in the library, I'm sure, if you want it. Um, so Gavin has a long history here, but actually just told me this is the first time he's been uh, on the LSE campus. Um, so Gavin, am I correct that you were just recently appointed, is it the Heinowitz Professor of right. Global oh, Health? Wow, hot off the press hot yesterday. Hot off your Twitter feed. Yes. yes. <laughs> so Gavin has just been appointed uh, Heinowitz Professor of Global Health at Duke University. Um, he's the director of the Center for Policy Impact uh, in, in Global Health at Duke. He was deputy editor of the Western Journal of Medicine, assistant editor at the BMJ, founding senior editor of PLOS Medicine, and led the launch of PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. He's also served on a number of international commissions like the Lancet Commission on Tuberculosis, International Commission's Lancet Commission on Investigating Health, and Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. Uh, for anyone uh, who's on the HPIPF program, you might have known that Gavin also just gave this year's, uh, this year's Keith Clark lecture at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he has very kindly agreed to present much of that material today again uh, as he speaks to the topic of shaping global health. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, there is what I would call a tragedy of evidence in global health. The good news is that evidence can matter, and the bad news is that it often does not. If you read Bill Clinton's massive autobiography, My Life, you'll see that one of his greatest regrets is that he didn't act on the evidence on clean needle exchange programs. And as a result, many people became infected with hepatitis, HIV. Those infections could have been averted. In contrast, President W. Bush pushed abstinence only education despite the lack of evidence. At best, at best, perhaps it delays sexual debut in adolescence by a, a few months, um, but it's associated with a much higher risk of sexually transmitted infections and unwanted pregnancy. And we in the global health world have not always done much better. Here are two studies done in the early 2000s of the decision-making processes the WHO and the World Bank. And they found that really what was happening was that decisions were being made on the opinions of wise men, wise old white men. It's called Gobsat. Anyone here has heard, heard of Gobsat? Good old boys sat around the table, Gobsat. <laughs> you fly old white men into Geneva, to a pine, and that is how you do global health. Sorry, Gavin, uh, the, the Zoom is blocking some of your slides. Let me just uh, move that. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, that little thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Thank you. About 20 years ago, malaria had become resistant to old monotherapies like chloroquine and SP. Luckily, there was a miracle drug, really. Um, called artemisinin-based combination therapy made from Qinghao Su, the sweet wormwood plant, Artemisia annua. Randomized control trials, systematic reviews had shown the superiority of ACTs over these old monotherapies, but the very influential USAID, I live in the United States, United States Agency for International Development, uh, did not support the scale up of ACTs. They said that it was not ready for prime time. And that, that stance that USAID took angered Fred Binker. If you work in the malaria world, you will know him. He is a giant of the malaria field, Ghanaian epidemiologist. And he told the New York Times, in poor countries like ours, children have only one chance. They struggle just to visit a health service. And if they get the wrong drug the first time, chloroquine or SP, 
they are then found dead. So driving evidence into global health is, I would argue, a matter of life and death. When I was at the BMJ, uh, I was an editor there, uh, starting in 1999, a whistleblower passed me a spreadsheet. And that Excel spreadsheet showed that the global fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria was essentially flooding much of sub-Saharan Africa with these old monotherapies um, like chloroquine and SP. And I think stories like this one, this wasn't the only one, there was another piece that came out in the Lancet. I think they helped to move the needle. Uh, the Global Fund held some emergency meetings. They reprogrammed their grants to shift away from chloroquine and SP towards ACTs, artemisinin-based combination therapies. And I learned an important lesson, I think, which I'll come back to in a minute, which is that storytelling can really have quite a powerful effect uh, in uh, driving evidence into policy. In our handbook of global health policy, um, I co-authored a chapter with Jimmy Volmink, one of the giants of evidence-based policy making. He directs South Africa's Cochrane Center. And we said, while there are many factors that will always influence global health policy making, we believe that evidence should be a crucially important input, one that could profoundly improve global public health. Much of this evidence that I'm talking about is generated at research universities like the one we are in today. And what I want to ask in this lecture is, can university-based researchers, can we actively shape global health policy making in ways that can improve global public health? And I believe they can. This was me about five years ago. That's our son. He's now six. Um, when he napped, we used to nap with him. He doesn't nap anymore. In fact, the day that he stopped napping, seriously, the day he stopped napping was the day that uh, North Carolina had its first stay at home order. I think kids just like, they knew, they just sensed it. If I stop napping, it's gonna irritate our parents. Anyway, that's when he stopped napping. But here am I, I'm, I'm dreaming at night and this is what I'm dreaming of. I'm dreaming because I'm sad and my you know, dreams are sad dreams and limited dreams. I dream of a shift away from global health opinion, based, global health policy based on opinion or whim towards policies based on evidence. So in the next about 30 minutes, I wanna leave some time for questions. I'm going to talk about this shift away from talking about evidence-based to evidence-informed global health policy and why that matters. I'm gonna talk about the phases that I think we've been through in understanding the, the translation of evidence into policy, a deficit phase, a dialogue phase, and a participatory phase. I want to share with you our experience, a small uh, policy laboratory at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. We created a policy laboratory that tries to bring in some of these principles. And lastly, I'm gonna give you a few case studies of our policy lab approach. Let me talk about this kind of shift in terminology. You know, those of us who talk about evidence-informed policymaking, evidence-based policymaking, we sometimes get a bit of pushback, pushback, right? You're being you know, very simplistic and you make it sound like it's very sort of deterministic and linear. And in fact, we in our, in our handbook, we try to reflect some of this debate. Um, alongside our chapter, we had a chapter by Justin Parkhurst and his colleague, Amy Barnes, um, that really questioned whether you can ever depoliticize global health. And that's a very good question. I would argue that Jimmy and I aren't naive enough to believe that global health policy making is totally straightforward and orderly and linear. Um, and absolutely, it is the case that policy making can never be divorced from its social and political milieu and context. And evidence is only one input into the uh, process. Um, and I think uh, Peter Piot, who was head of UNAIDS and then the Dean of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, he gives a very powerful example, I think, which is, let's say that a rigorous study, really high quality evidence, shows that the best way to control a particular infectious disease 
is to put everyone with a disease onto a remote island. No humane society, says Peter, would accept this approach because our values, our respect for human dignity would not allow it. If you haven't read this book by Annette Boaz and colleagues, What Works Now, I think it's one of the best books on this topic. I really recommend it. This is a nuanced relationship, they say, that the relationship between evidence, policy and practice is nuanced, dynamic, politis, political and contested. And hence, you see this shift away from the term evidence-based global health policy towards evidence-informed, recognizing that evidence is just one of many inputs. And it's actually not the only kind of knowledge. I was on a panel just about an hour ago and ran over, actually I took an Uber over, um, straight from that panel. The panel was on decolonizing the curriculum. That's a whole other topic. Um, and a lot of that panel's discussion was about forms of knowledge and who is generating that knowledge um, and how much of it is being generated by cishet white men um, like me. The science and art of shaping global health, I think, has gone through three uh, identifiable phases. <laughs> with, with all of those caveats in mind, I think we can identify these phases. A deficit or linear phase, a dialogue or relationships phase, and a participation phase. I think for the longest time, many of us working in academic public health, academic global health, labored under this linear model, right? We generate research, we publish it in a journal, we push it out, we get it to a policymaker, and then she sort of acts on it. Now, I think that that highly simplistic sort of linear you know, chain model, I think there is some value in improving the flow I think there are barriers in that flow, and I think we should remove those barriers. But we now know from empirical research that just removing those barriers is not enough on its own. I think it is necessary. Policymakers do need some way of hearing about the evidence, but I don't think it's enough on its own. And a growing body of research has shown that in addition to policymakers you know, getting the evidence, there needs to be a relationship, a, a dialogue. Um, but wait, there's more, because in addition to getting the evidence and having that dialogue, we now know that the most effective way for achieving sustained policy change is to create entire environments of participation with researchers and policymakers acting at multiple different levels of the system, an approach that recognizes that policy change is complicated, it's multifaceted, and it needs action from both inside and outside organizations. I want to touch briefly on all three of those because we've drawn on insights from all three of those models in creating our policy laboratory. So look, here's is very idealized. This is from Jimmy and I's chapter, very idealized sort of model um, of how evidence could flow to policymakers. Uh, in global health, you know, most health research is still conducted in high income countries for high income country policymakers. But in an ideal world, you would have much more generation of primary research relevant to low and middle income countries. There would be systematic reviews of that evidence. It would reach policymakers. They would value it and implement. And at all along that process, you see barriers to little research, to few systematic reviews evidence not reaching, not using, um, and insufficient study on how we do large scale change. I want to focus on two in particular, because I think they are particularly important. The first is that evidence may not reach policymakers. It may be locked away behind actual barriers, you know, actual copyright or subscription barriers. Or even if it isn't, it may be presented to them in such a complicated way that they don't get it, it doesn't have a a clear story, as John Lavis at McMaster University, who is a professor of knowledge translation in global health, a giant in this field, policymakers here are hearing noise, noise instead of music. About 20 years ago, um, 2002, 2003, I think it was, I co-taught a workshop 
in Addis Ababa, co-organized by the WHO, TDR, the Tropical Disease uh, part of the WHO, and FAME, the Forum for African Medical Editors. And I met this guy, James Tumwene, Professor of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Makarira University. And James had just been asked by the WHO to go on a mission to South Sudan to investigate an outbreak, an outbreak of a condition called nodding disease. It's a pediatric seizure disorder. It's called nodding disease because the kids take a small bite of food, then they have an absence seizure. So they appear to be nodding, probably parasitic, thought to be uh, onchocerciasis. The first thing, of course, that James is going to do is to go online and read the you know, thousand or so previous papers on nodding disease. We would always do that. We would always want to build on the shoulders of giants, but he couldn't. Locked out of reading the literature. Now, you know, you and I, LSE, at Duke, we don't see any kind of barrier when we go online, right? Our universities are paying these giant subscriptions so that you have access. But if he wanted to look at this paper on nodding syndrome in Uganda, it would cost him $31. And he had to see about a thousand papers. This is a topic that I have um, really been quite heavily involved with in my life. I think um, tackling these sorts of barriers, you don't need these barriers. They, don't, they shouldn't exist, particularly in the on online world. Um, <coughs> it's really, really frustrated me. I was part of the Public Library of Science, international movement, a nonprofit movement of physicians like myself and scientists dedicated to making the global literature a global public good, not a private commodity to be owned and sold at huge profit um, to, uh, to mostly to drug companies actually, to read. So I think people don't realize that a typical paper about a new drug in a journal can earn that journal around a million dollars, selling access to that journal to drug companies. Um, so I wrote this paper in the Health and Human Rights Journal, and I argued that this, this walled garden, this enclosure of the scholarly health commons was a rights violation. It was starving health workers of essential information. It was hindering health system strengthening. It was impeding health research and development. And it's been brilliant to see things change. You know, much of the literature is now open access. And actually, there are many initiatives now aimed, for example, to support an EVITNIT at synthesizing the literature and synthesizing systematic reviews and delivering it to policymakers worldwide in attractive ways so that they do hear music uh, and not noise. So that's that one barrier. The other barrier that I wanted to briefly mention is that policymakers may not use evidence, right, even if it reaches them. Uh, this is Vince Cable, former UK business secretary, and he talked about the five S's of why policymakers don't use evidence. They have to act quickly. Um, they can't go too deep into an issue. They have to stay on message, so the spin. Sometimes they make decisions in secret and their scientific knowledge may be thin. So beyond Vince Cable's own personal reflections, there is strong evidence, strong research evidence and systematic review evidence that there are barriers to policymakings using evidence. So we've got evidence on the use of evidence, a very meta, makes my mind spin. We've got research evidence on the evidence of driving evidence into policy. We know research evidence is competing with other factors like values. We know research evidence is not often relevant to what policymakers are working on at that moment in time. It may not be timely enough um, and there may actually not be mechanisms to bring researchers and policymakers to the table. And I think all of that does have really quite profound implications for the kind of work that we do. It does mean that you have to think about getting the right evidence at the right time to the right people. Um, and that's a much more active process. That is way more active than just sort of thinking, OK, I'll get a grant. One day I'll publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine, they'll sell it for a million dollars to pharma, and then I'll move on, just kidding. Maybe, I'm, well, maybe you've done a drug trial, so maybe it will earn them a million dollars. One problem is I sometimes go off on these tangents, so I have to be reined in. And my six-year-old says, 
going off on a tandem, which is quite cute. Him and I on a little tandem bike. Um, so we know we've got to close gaps in getting evidence policy, that linear chain. But beyond that, um, clearly we also have to improve the dialogue aspect. And there is now an increasing interest in the role of so-called knowledge brokers or what you could call evidence entrepreneurs, skilled intermediaries who are excellent at being the missing link, say Ward and colleagues in this evidence to action chain. So we know that we have to do better getting evidence to policy makers. We know we have to improve uh, dialogue. And finally, in this sort of third model, this participation model, we know that systems are crucial, right? We need to understand the complicated systems in which policymakers operate, and then where, how, when evidence fits into that system. And we ideally should all be participating at multiple levels of the system and co-creating knowledge together. What my colleague, um, Kelly Brownell, who directs the World Food Policy Center at Duke, a real giant in food policy. He was on the time, 100 most powerful people in the world list not long ago for taking on the um, fast food industry and their targeting of children, or trying to do something to stop advertising. Uh, and the intellectual architecture for sugar tax, which has been used in many countries to reduce the consumption of sugar and sugar sweetened beverages. He calls it strategic science, where you are co-creating science together. Researchers are trying to understand the big questions facing policymakers and then generating research that will matter to them um, rather than just doing research that they think is of interest. They are doing research that matters to them. And ideally, uh, generating knowledge locally or at the very least, generating knowledge that can be contextualized in other settings. So I want to now um, talk about how we have tried to take insights from these approaches, these models, and apply them in launching a multidisciplinary evidence to policy laboratory, the Center for Policy Impact and Global Health, which is about six years old, based in the Duke Global Health Institute. And when we launched it, we said, we'll design prototype and model alternative solutions to help mobilize and target financing to improve the health of the world's poor. We mostly work on big picture strategic questions in global health around the financing and governance and architecture and delivery of global health. Much of our work is with policymakers at the global level and in ministries, ministries of health and ministries of finance. So from the linear model, if you like, we generate policy briefs, we try and do storytelling, we try and look out for windows of opportunity for when our work could have an impact. From the dialogue model, we are very heavily engaged with policymakers. We host policy dialogues, either in our DC office or with our partners in different countries. We are involved in knowledge brokering and we do some rapid response where a policymaker says, hey, by tomorrow, can you answer X problem or by next week? It's difficult to do that in a very sustained way unless you've got dedicated staff and funding as John Lavis has in his famous Canadian rapid response group, they will answer any policymakers request for evidence for an evidence brief. And I think they do a one day turnaround, a seven day turnaround and a 28 day turnaround. Obviously in 28 days, you can get a much, much more uh, in-depth assessment of the evidence, but that is a dedicated rapid response unit. Ours is a bit more ad hoc. And then through the participation systems model, we try and you know, engage at multiple levels of the system, co-create evidence with policymakers as much as we can. We try and get engaged in strategic science and in localizing knowledge. So our policy lab model has, I think, six key components. There are others, but I think in reflecting on our approach, I think these are the six that have, um, that are the most important. The first is that we are a global network of researchers. We partner with 
universities and think tanks in six transitioning middle-income countries, countries that are transitioning out of development assistance for health and are undergoing epidemiological transition, uh, demographic transition, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, India, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. And here are our PIs in each of our partner countries. Our center itself, most of our team are from low and middle income countries. And I think that is really helpful and really important. Uh, our research director, for example, Asandu Ogwoji, Nigerian physician and health systems researcher, he's very well known and very well respected in Nigeria. So when we are on calls with our partner, he is known to them and he is trusted by them. And I think that makes a, you know, a very big difference. We get engaged in policy activities all the time. We recently co-hosted with our Sri Lanka partner um, a national dialogue. Um, we have a project on what we call the four Ds of health transition. I think it's one of the biggest challenges in global health right now is how transitioning countries are responding to the four Ds. The loss of development assistance, the demographic transition, the shift in diseases towards non-communicable diseases and the shift ideally towards domestic finance. So this was a, a dialogue that we co-hosted with the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I, IPS, one of our partners in Sri Lanka, on planning for universal health coverage amidst these transitions. Um, we co-hosted with Strathmore University, our partner in Kenya, a national dialogue on how COVID-19 is affecting transitions. Obviously, some countries that were set to transition have been given a grace period by donors in light of what happened with COVID. And then we have an office in DC um, where when we had done a study on how the US government can improve its role in product development for global health, um, we then held a, a policy dialogue. It's an amazing office, fantastic location. The only thing we had to do, well, I'm going to get a bit political now, I don't know if that's allowed at LSE. The only thing we had to do was cover up, we have to cover up the curtains, we have to put curtains up over the windows because it literally overlooked the Trump Tower. So we, you know, we couldn't look at Trump Tower, but it's been bought by someone else now, so we don't have to cover up the windows. There you go, a little bit of politics. Um, one of the ways in which I think we have been able to establish quite strong policy relationships is we have a mid-career health policy fellows program. It's small. We have a, um, a charitable foundation that supports it, and we have fellows who are mostly from ministries, typically ministries of health, some are academics, some are from think tanks, but mostly from ministries who come, spend some time with us, they take courses, they do a study, um, they do their own research, policy research, um, they network, uh, they come with us to meetings at the World Bank, etc. And then what is, I think, really helpful is they return to their country, we stay in touch, the study that they've done, they're able to literally implement because they're in a ministry and we become policy partners, you know, kind of, as I said, forever. Um, so, so that's been really amazing. And a, a, two of our recent fellows have just been appointed to very senior positions. Many of you may know Justice Dolvignon, uh, Ghanaian health economist. So he's now the um, acting head of a new health economics unit in Africa CDC. And we just signed an MOU with them. And then Kofi Abubakar, is now the head of health policy planning and international collaboration at Nigeria's National Health Insurance Scheme. So that's been um, terrific. They go on to publish their research as well. Here's a study, for example, that Uchi Shalom published um, on maintaining UHC coverage in Nigeria after donors leave in health policy and planning um, and another study on capitation in Ghana um, that Gilbert Abiro, one of our scholars, uh, published, one of our fellows published. But the third thing is that we look out for windows of opportunity um, uh, or, you know, we get asked to do quick analyses uh, in a timely way. So, for example, when the COVID pandemic hit, the World Bank asked if we would lead the first kind of working paper on how we vaccinate the world. So we had like a few weeks to just try and pull something together. We often have to do that very quickly, look at what data are available, do some quick and dirty modeling, speak to people and try and put it all together. And so we actually took our policy fellows to this first meeting on this topic in February 
2020. Um, and then not long after that, the Global Pandemic Monitoring Board, uh, they asked our team, they gave us five days to say, can you estimate how much the world needs to mobilize to respond to COVID? Easy question. So again, five days, you know, we had done a bit of work in this area that we were able to draw upon. We came up with this figure, $8 billion. How did we come up with it? Just kidding. It was hard, core, rigorous research. No, I mean, it was based on what we know about what it would typically cost to develop pandemic vaccines, what we know about what it would typically cost to, you know, create a stockpile. It was based on other things. So not quite, um, uh, you know, not, not quite sucking out of the thumb. And that became the basis for the $8 billion request at the EU pledging conference, which was uh, thankfully met. We are very multidisciplinary um, in our team and across Duke, and we collaborate with partners across Duke all the time. Uh, we just, for example, collaborated for the first time with a business professor. We've actually not done that before. Um, David McAdams, uh, business professor, professor of economics, and he is one of the world experts on using game theory to tackle global health and social challenges. He has a book called Games to Play. It's brilliant. And... Um, we got together to try and see if we could apply game theory to improve the design of COVAX. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access Facility. This was the only multilateral mechanism for trying to achieve global vaccine equity. Um, so we tried to see how, that's, how its functioning could be improved. We wrote a piece in the DMJ on what game theory can teach us about controlling pandemics. And we briefed the National Academy of Medicine. They have a committee um, that is uh, devoted actually to flu pandemic preparedness. We presented that to the committee. The committee is chaired by Debbie Sridhar, who you may know, and um, uh, Peter Sands, who is the head of the Global Fund. I worry that Peter is still sitting there in his room waiting to connect to audio, but hopefully not. Um, so, Storytelling. This is a one. This is a one where I think academics have different views on this. We have. We've clearly cro we've crossed that Rubicon, if you like. We do, you know, take to the media. We do write op eds. Um, uh, I recently co-authored a piece for the Washington Post, for example, on you know when it was clear that Congress was not going to pass any funding for the international COVID response. Um, I, I write a, a column for Time magazine. And, you know, we, I guess, have essentially made that decision um, that we see value in storytelling. We see value in, um, in taking uh, our message to a broader media. I mean, I think there is a, there is a way in which we can, you know, amplify um, and get a, you know, a bigger reach. But we are aware at all times that we're doing that, that we are, we are walking a fine line. Um, here's my colleague, Catherine Oliver, LSHTM and Paul Kearney, who say in this terrific um, paper on this topic, effective actors combine evidence with manipulative emotional appeals to influence the policy agenda. And this is the question, should scientists do the same or would the reputational costs outweigh the policy benefits? And it's something that we ask ourselves a lot. We are not advocates. We cannot be advocates. Uh, you know, our university doesn't allow it. Our funders typically don't allow it. You cannot lobby, you cannot be an activist or an advocate. But the way in which we try and square this circle, and you know, maybe I'm just convincing myself of this, is that we call ourselves advocates for the evidence. So if the evidence shows X, we feel comfortable in going out into the world um, and saying, look, here is what the evidence um, shows. And lastly, uh, we, you know, we are not the only folks working in this space. We try and, you know, we think two plus two can equal five if we work together and synergize. So here are just some of our partners who we've done a lot of work with. Uh, one in the UK, for example, um, ODI, Seek Development in Berlin, CGD, and others. And just here are some examples of recent work that we've done with our partners, performance-based financing at Gavi, at donor transitions, and um, in investment in primary care. In the last few minutes, I just want to give a few case studies of where you know, we have applied this policy laboratory 
approach. Um, and in fact, I want to just give an example from each kind, from this sort of the linear model, this dialogue model, and then this more complicated, multi-layered participatory model. So when COVID hit, um, we worked with our partners actually at uh, the Nigerian uh, AIDS Control Agency, NACA, on very quickly laying, way, laying out ways in which HIV financing could be maintained in the face of COVID-19 um, and briefed uh, the government on that, quite a sort of linear approach. Similarly, we worked with our partners in India early in the pandemic to estimate the cost and affordability of COVID testing and treatment, um, which we shared with the Indian government and actually which got quite a lot of press pickup. Um, and then in an ongoing way, we've done a lot of work on understanding what's in the pipeline for neglected diseases. We do quite a lot of work on, on the policy side of research and development. What's in the pipeline for about 35 different tropical diseases, neglected diseases, how much would it cost to uh, push these products forward to launch? And that regularly gets picked up by policymakers and advocacy groups. Always happy to go and talk to advocacy groups about the evidence and then they can run with it. And in fact, one, the, this paper got picked up by the New York Times where we found that based on what's in the pipeline, we were unlikely to see highly effective vaccines against HIV, malaria and TB. In some ways, it's just a numbers game. If you don't have a lot of candidates, you're unlikely to get um, uh, product launches with $3 billion a year. Probably need to triple that at least. We do have a malaria vaccine. It is not uh, highly effective. From the dialogue model, I think one way of conceptualizing the dialogue model is that if you are a researcher who regularly interacts with policymakers, and if you kind of know each other's values, you know what, what, what makes them tick, um, and you understand each other, and you're able to generate some kind of evidence product that's short and beautifully designed and easy to read, and you get it to them at the right time uh, in a window of opportunity, you know, that's when you can have the biggest impact and influence on decisions. So let me give you an example of where I think this did happen. We got a request in 2017 from the G20 Global Health Working Group. Could we help the G20 think about the financing of pandemic and epidemic preparedness? We quickly co-convened a policy workshop with CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. They are the group that is financing pandemic vaccine development in Norway. We held it at the National Academy of Medicine uh, in Washington, DC. We produced a brief that in retrospect had a terrible non-punchy title. I wish we hadn't called it this, but there you go. International Collective Action for Epidemic and Pandemic Preparedness, an economic policy brief for the G20 Health Working Group. Doesn't exactly roll off your tongue, not great storytelling. <laughs> noise instead of music. Anyway, it worked. Um, so we went off to Berlin, briefed them, uh, and the recommendations of this brief made it into the G20 leaders declaration, uh, which this is very much our language. We advocate for sufficient sustainable funding to strengthen global health capacities, including formal rapid financing mechanism, the WHO health emergencies program, fostering R&D preparedness coordination, and, and so on. Um, you might just say, well, blah, blah, blah. Who cares what the G27, G20 says, blah, blah, blah. Who cares what the G7 say? They're just, you know, it's all hot air. They meet in these fancy places. There's a photo op, they write something, who cares? What's interesting is, and we looked at this, the question of whether G7 or G20 summits matter to global health can be and has been empirically answered. And the news is surprisingly good. When you look at what's in the G7 communique or what's in the G20 communicate. Over the ensuing year or two, you actually see attention to and funding for what's in the G7 or G20 communicate translate into action. So it really actually does matter. For example, the G8 resolutions in Genoa in 2000, sorry, in Okinawa in 2000, Genoa in 2001 led to the launch of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, arguably being the most impactful global health initiative in history um, for discussion and debate. 
Finally, the final thing is then through this more complex participatory systems model, I think the work that we're doing around these four Ds of transition uh, is, is an example of that. Here's a piece that Asondu Abuoji, our research lead, Justice Novanyo and Ghana, who I mentioned earlier, and I wrote for Cross Medicine, where we said it's no exaggeration to say that maintaining continued global health progress and certainly achieving acceleration in progress will depend on how domestic and international health policymakers navigate these four transitions. And you can't do them in isolation. They are totally interlinked. Ghana, for example, as you may know, is graduating from support from Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. It has to start planning for financing its own vaccination programs. But it cannot only, doesn't have the luxury of only thinking of planning. For domestic vaccination because it has hit a level of obesity or overweight of over 40 percent so it has a non-communicable diseases explosion on its hand so is it if it's not planning for the the disease the epidemiological transition and demographic transition at the same time it's going to run into trouble so the question then that we've been dealing with with our six uh partner countries is what are the shifts in disease burden and demography ahead and how are those going to affect how you finance health and then where is that financing going to come from and that is what we are doing we're working with policymakers to generate data evidence and analysis to support this kind of joined up strategies with a variety of expertise and linkages with policymakers at multiple levels of the system local national regional and international this matters because if you don't plan for transition, and if you do it suddenly, you can actually cause tremendous health systems shocks and even disease resurgence. Perhaps the most famous example is Romania and the Global Fund. The Global Fund left Romania suddenly without planning. It now has much better processes for avoiding this. In Bucharest, HIV prevalence among people who inject drugs one of the vulnerable populations was 1.1% in 2009. The global fund leaves suddenly with no preparation or planning. Look at what happens to HIV prevalence in this group, 6.9%, 53% in 2013. So this stuff is really extremely important. And this is, what, this is the kind of work that we are doing at multiple levels of the system to try and help you know, plan, to prepare, to avert these shocks. What are the needs of transitioning countries? There's been a hell of a lot written about what donors think about transitions. We've been doing a ton of research on the perspectives and the needs of countries themselves. Who stands to win and who stands to lose when aid disappears? We're doing a lot of work understanding who is benefiting the most right now from publicly financed health programs, particularly aid finance. What are the health systems needs ahead of transition? I think one of the things that we are finding in our research, perhaps not surprisingly, is that a robust health system can prepare for um, transition uh, and help to avert shocks. How can civil society be engaged? What we know from the Romania experience and from what we, what we can learn from the more positive experience in Mexico and China is that Look, there are many governments who stigmatize vulnerable groups. They stigmatize men who have sex with men. They stigmatize injection drug users. They stigmatize transgender people. But we could argue about the Global Fund and Gavi and the role of aid and the colonial nature of aid you know, for, for, for a very long time. But one thing that I think that these organizations have done well and the Global Fund has done well is to say, you country X, you will not get funding from us unless key populations, vulnerable populations are included in your plan. And typically, those populations are being reached by civil society organizations. So in Mexico and China, when the Global Fund left, through social contracting where the government funds NGOs and CSOs, services continued to vulnerable groups. That didn't happen in Romania, which is probably why there was a catastrophe. There are tools available to help countries get ready for transition. We've been doing some work about how those tools could be strengthened. And then finally, we have a big interest in understanding the role of global public goods for health. 
Research and Development for Diseases of Poverty, pooled procurement and purchasing, sounds boring, but actually when donors have left middle-income countries, a really effective way that they can get lower prices on drugs and vaccines is for them to join forces and buy in bulk. That can drive, um, drive prices down. And so we argue that with a joined up strategy, these four Ds of global health could actually be an opportunity for accelerated rather than stalled progress. Finally, this is Albert Sabin, about the oral polio vaccine, who said a scientist who is also a human being cannot rest while knowledge which might reduce suffering rests on the shelf. I think we have a duty to make sure that knowledge is taken up. And I think there's a risk that evidence generated in places like this in universities may just sit on the shelf unless we engage in what is actually a very active process. There isn't a single silver bullet for doing that. I do think we need a range of approaches and insights. And I think it is, a part of it is a bit of, you know, art, you know, storytelling, crafting compelling messages, having a punchy message. And, and there is a science, we are learning more and more about this science of linkage, exchange and systems of participation. I do not have time to thank everybody. Nothing I have ever done in global health has been alone. Um, really very amazing team that I am lucky to work with. And thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to taking a few questions. And, and thank you all. Um, we also have about 30 people online. Oh, very good. Um, so we have they might have sent some questions. Yeah, on. one I've seen one question come in so far. Uh, so I will start with that one online. Moji, are you monitoring questions as well? Um, do you want to do you want to do the online ones then? Um, and we'll start okay. with the first one. All right. Um, so this is a question from Elizabeth. Would it be fair to say the industry or company advocates have been doing participation all along to get the change they want? And it has taken the academic world time to catch up. Oh my God, what a great question. So yes, the pharmaceutical industry has been very good at influencing policymakers, at uh, creating, you know, demand for their products. Uh, they fund, you know, without getting too cynical, but it's a fact, they fund patient groups. You would never know that a particular patient group is being funded by, you know, companies. They are brilliant at messaging. I live in a country that has direct consumer advertising in the United States. Um, and um, it's really the, the, they use manipulative appeals and powerful appeals. And it is the case, you know, my clinical friends say people turn up clinic and they print it out or they grab the ad that says, you know, choose this drug. So yes, we have a lot to learn. There's no doubt about that. I would also say that during COVID, this is a personal, um, uh, this is something I'm personally very interested in. We've been extremely, extremely slow to realize that the very powerful for-profit anti-vaccine industry has been amazing at peddling its wares, amazing. They sell fake cures, they sell books, they sell detox teas, all of that kind of nonsense. Wherever you see that industry, and there's about a dozen of them who are the worst offenders, they make hundreds of millions of dollars with their grift. There's an anti-vax message, and then they're selling something. And we, and again, in the, in the academy, I think we think, oh, well, let's publish a study in a year. That's not good enough. I think we actually need to treat this in much more of an active way. I think we actually need to survey some kind of surveillance mechanism, and then we activate to say, you know, that's really a poor The problem, of course, is that, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of people have died as a result of that message. So. Thank you. Okay, I, I don't see any more online right now. We can take from the room as well. So please don't hesitate to put your hand up. Um, it's worth pointing out there's well established, there's very good evidence on gender bias and language bias in asking questions after seminars, especially when speakers represent, unfortunately, only one demographic. So keeping that in mind, I would encourage anyone to, to, to raise your hand. Uh, don't be shy to do so. Um, are there any more questions for Gavin? He's got a few more minutes. So I'll wait for a few people to, to if you want to put your hands up, okay. Um, can I start here in the front? Yep. Yes, and then we'll move next to you, and then we'll move to that. Um, I was just interested with your comment um, around, obviously, like the moral views or political views of scientists, and how you said that trying to maintain that separation to 
maintain the reputation of scientists yeah. in the public eye. I just wanted to hear a little bit more of your thoughts about that um, because it seems to reflect a lot of um, political thinking of trying to maintain respectability and establishments mm -hmm. where I think, um, as you just mentioned, one of the key concerns is people who are not like uh, coming from a different place and not respecting those establishments and whether you think it's worth maintaining that respectability or more actively engaging with political discourse. It's a country. brilliant question and you know and thank you for asking it. I think one of the one of the things I say to my student I mean I give a, a talk on this very topic is and I, I, I say is I don't think there's a right answer to that question and I think there's there's clearly a spectrum of where academics find themselves right and I think what I say to my students is I think you're going to have to decide for yourself where you are on that spectrum at one end I have got colleagues who are epidemiologists who say I count I saw I put out the data and that's it I have I, I really do not want to be out there you know, pushing for some kind of change based on what I do. And I have enormous respect for that. That's where they see their strengths. That's where they feel comfortable. And then at the very other, well, not necessarily at the other end of the spectrum, but there's clearly academics who feel, you know, that what that their research should really inform policy and they want to be engaged in that. So, you know, let me give you an example. I have a colleague at LSHTM, Kathy Zimmerman, who is one of the foremost experts on trafficking on the health of trafficked people. She has also written guidelines on how to interview trafficked people, including guidelines for the police. She is very engaged in policy. You will see her in parliaments. You will see her out there talking to policymakers. And I think, you know, I think it's probably somewhere, we all, you know, we're all somewhere on that spectrum. And I think we have to find a comfort level. I do think though that one of the you know, one of the um, advantages of being an academic is that you are seen as coming from the academy and of being independent and of producing rigorous research. And I think certainly when we, you know, when we're interested in doing research, um, that those are features that we will, you know, in, a, in a bid for a grant, for example, those are, I think, features that count for us. We're often up against, you know, consulting groups, for example, um, and I think that the sort of independence and rigor is one of our calling cards. So we don't want to lose that. I think we have to, it, it, it's, we have to be careful. You know, I think it's a, a fine line. So Gavin, I just want to check what time you can run up to. Um, I, can, I, I, can, I can keep going. Okay, so yeah, there are yeah. two, but do you want to take more than one at a time, maybe the next two? Yeah, so there two, let's two take two, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Similar question to Kate's. Um, so, was, you know, right now scientists, or up until a certain period of time, scientists were seen as, a respectable neutral group. And this is a fairly American-centric example. I don't want to extend the United States to the rest of the world, but in the US in current times, scientists and academics have become this elite group that people don't want to trust anymore, especially those who are perhaps from more social conservative backgrounds. And I think this is a recent shift. And how do you work around that mistrust that people have toward the so-called liberal elite? Do you want to take another question? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll try and run out the clock. <laughs> yeah, it's it's We're going to take another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll come back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll take you two at once. Hi, uh, look, thank you for your insights. I was just uh, wondering also regarding the political nature of today's uh, societies. Since ever more, there's, there's an ever more um, polarization in a lot of societies, for instance, oh, yeah. in your home society. Oh, yeah. How how are you thinking about sustainability in your consultations? So if if you're going from a Trump government to a Biden government that completely overhauls yeah. all levels of government and then maybe at some point going back to a conservative uh, yeah. government. And yeah. With society being so split and often fighting to overcome any progress and change that the previous enemy yeah. How are you working around that? Yeah, I mean, I think they're actually linked. Yeah. They're very good linked questions. I mean, I guess the first response to that is that, you know, in the work that we do, we will look out for policy opportunities wherever they are. We will, you know, acknowledge the political realities. We will try and work within those realities. Um, we might change our messaging accordingly. Um, so if, you know, I'll just off the top of my head, for example, if we know that a particular government focuses much more on economic 
aspects of economic growth or whatever it might be, and um, regardless of what the work we have done is found, has found, we will you know, try and focus more on the growth aspect, right? There's certainly a number of audiences where trying to make the moral case for doing X is not going to get you anywhere. You know, trying to say this is a rights-based issue is not going to go anywhere. But if you walk into a room and talk about the, 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 the returns on investment of X, that can be very profound. So with the Trump administration, for example, if we were talking about improving, increasing you know, funding for research and development for neglected diseases, we've done this. We've said, look, these are the returns to the United States. We've done this in North Carolina. We've said, actually, we've gone to North Carolina lawmakers and said, if you can encourage the administration to invest more in global health R&D, here are the returns to North Carolina. Now, the science on that is a bit, ooh, but, you know, um, there, is a way of do, there is a way of doing it, right? There is a way of seeing how investments, you know, benefit the country, and then you can do some back of the envelope division into different states. But anyway, so you can see why, so the way in which you frame things, I think you frame um, accordingly. Um, and then on uh, scientists, I mean, I think, I think scientists can and should be engaged more in, um, you know, in, in not all scientists are going to feel comfortable doing this. I get that. But I think that there is a role for scientists in engaging with the public. I think there is clearly a really important role for researchers, for academics in doing participatory action research with communities, not on with communities. In fact, ironically, <coughs> Well, maybe it's not that ironic, over half of the research we do in the Duke Global Health Institute is actually research in Durham. We have huge inequities um, uh, in Durham, East Durham in particular, um, very low income part of the world. So I think there are ways to work with the community, to build trust with the community um, and to get more publicly engaged for sure. Motions another online one. Online um, from Charles. I wonder if Gavin has thoughts on academics collaborating with big business, especially if those companies have the data needed. A more recent example is the recent Uber files where researchers were funded to produce studies. Oh my God, I saw that. <laughs> um, it's a great question. So um, a couple of things. So, so we, I and so I in my personal you know, academic life, we at our center have never taken funding from pharmaceutical companies. We get off pharmaceutical companies approach academics all the time. There is a lot of research funding from pharma, um, particularly in the clinical world, obviously clinical research. I am not criticizing researchers who do, who do trials, who are, you know, um, look, I got the Pfizer vaccine, three doses, our kid, Got the Pfizer vaccine, um, three doses, you just got boosted. You know, I'm very grateful to Pfizer. I think they have price gouged and I wish they were doing more, but that's a whole other topic. Um, so I'm not anti-industry, obviously. We have made the decision, I have made the decision that the reputational risks are too large, you know, particularly if you're working in the policy world and that independence from pharma matters enormously. Um, and if you are obviously going to accept pharmaceutical funding, I think you need to clearly have conflicts of interest um, policies uh, in place. I think the very, when I read that story about Uber, so this is academics who, Uber wanted them to show something. They wanted them to do a study that would show X. That is a huge problem. I once had, how can I do this without causing trouble? Okay, I once had an organization, friend. a friend. You were friend. Yeah. Okay, I had a friend, a six foot five Jewish guy, his name, you know, rhymed with, you know, you know, pay me, um, uh, Kevin pay me, let's call him. And a, a philanthropic funder approached this guy, Kevin, and said, we will give you money to do a study that shows X. We, if we say X, people will go, oh, you're a, you know, we know your views. We need an independent academic person with a good reputation to go public to say, I did a study on X. Um, and I, I, you see, I declined. And I think that's really problematic. I think, the, I think the minute that any kind of funder, big business, 
whoever it might be, says, we'd like you to do a study to show X. It's done. You're done. You're done. You're not a researcher anymore. You're a, you're the, uh, you're a marketing arm. So I think that's hugely problematic. So I think it's the, t the relationship, the conflict of interest policy, you know, the, 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 the requirements from you as a researcher, all of those things matter. Okay, thank you. We've run up to the schedule um, was, was four. I don't know if you want to stay and take any more. There are any pressing. I've got to go and pick up my six years from grandma. So I think I think we we can't hold Gavin any longer. So thank you all so much for uh, joining us. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. The technology. I forgot to say that this is hosted by both the LSE Global Health Initiative and the Department of Health Policy. So thank you again on behalf of, of both of us, uh, or these organizations, uh, and thank you all for coming. See you hopefully very much. <laughs>